Hello, everybody, and welcome to Write the Docs podcast, episode number 33. We're in the new year. It's 2021, or what I like to call 2021 Bravo, because the alpha version had a fair few bugs. Um, uh, welcome to the show today. It's going to be an interesting discussion all about um, screenshots and graphics. So um, let me go and give you a bit of a run through about what we're going to be talking about today. So technical writers mostly agree that one of the most challenging and frustrating things about our job is managing screenshots in our product documentation. How many times have you needed to take complex screenshots of your product and meticulously mark them up with call outs only to be told that a field has changed and you need to do everything again? It's so frustrating and demoralizing as a writer because it feels like wasted effort. But what if there was a way to create screenshots that could withstand the rapid iterations of a product under development while still conveying valuable meaning to your readers? Today, we're joined by Anton Bolland from TechSmith, who's going to tell us how we can do this using low detail screenshots that let you focus your user's attention on just the bits of the interface that matter. Welcome to the show, Anton. How are you going? Hey, well, thank you for having me. It's been really great to be on this show because I've been following Write the Docs for a couple of years now. Um, but just real quick to introduce myself, my name is Anton Bollen. I have a fancy job title. It's Customer and Market Strategist uh, for a company called TechSmith. Uh, TechSmith, for those of you that don't know, I'll, be, I'll keep it very brief. It's a software company out of Michigan in the United States, and it's been around for 30 years, which is, I think, quite long for a software company. And for this entire time, they've been making more or less, uh, well, they, they had one upfront running product called Snagit that a lot of people know. And uh, I've been with them since 2003, so uh, a very long time. 2003. Well, that is a long time. I had no idea that TechSwift was actually based out of Michigan. So there you go. I'm learning stuff already on the show today. It's great. Um, <laughs> great to have you on today. This is going to be a very interesting discussion with a, a subject that's probably close to everyone's hearts about screenshots. So um, I think we'll dive in. But before we um, go too much further in, I'll just uh, say welcome to Tom Johnson. How are you? I'm doing great. Hey, and I appreciate it. You switched from how, how are you going to how are you? It was nice. Yeah, that's right. I thought I'd just uh, try something different today. Not intentional, just because. <laughs> um, um, okay, well, um, let's uh, jump into some pretty interesting topics today. So I think we should probably start as we always do with new topics um, that we're, we're doing the show with a bit of a, a basic overview um, of of what we're going to be talking about today. So I mentioned in the in the intro that we're talking about low detail screenshots, but there's another name for them, isn't there, Anton? And I'm just wondering if you could yeah. um, sort of describe a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today, and sort of give us a, a really top level overview about what we're talking about. Right, absolutely. So the other term that um, we've been hearing quite a bit, I've been saying quite a bit, is simplified user interface screenshots or simplified user interface design in short SUI. It's kind of like cookie, but SUI. That's how mm -hmm. I at least remember it always. And the definition I've been hearing and saying is that it's a design treatment for screenshots that take a software's product interface and they turn it into more simplified, almost representation. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's not really it's not an original screenshot per se, but it's a representation of the screenshot. And within that screenshot, all unnecessary or unimportant elements that are distracting or at least are not important for the main action, whatever it might be, they get reduced, removed, or yeah, usually covered up by simple shapes. And I'm sure if I show you a screenshot, um, you would definitely recognize it. And actually, oftentimes when people ask me, like, what is that Sui thing? It's, it's kind of hard to say that, like, an abstract representation that doesn't make sense. So oftentimes, I honestly, I pull out my phone and I show someone a screenshot and they will always say, wow, yeah, of course I've seen that. I've seen that all over the place because yeah, it's creeping up in all kinds of different forms of content nowadays. But yeah, that's where that term kind of, I don't know if that's where the term comes from, but it's simplified user interface design. That's what I, me and many other professionals have been using. That's a really interesting, oh, that's definitely a good summary of it. I'd agree with obviously what you're saying there because I've, I've seen this technique before. Um, but what surprised me is that I actually thought it was um, a, essentially a product feature that was designed by Snagit, but I 
I get the feeling it's not. It's been around for a lot longer than that, hasn't it? As a as a treatment yeah. for images. Yeah, it really has. And actually, I want to um, almost take a step back from that because the idea of simplifying visual instruction, it, graphics, diagrams, is not really new to any of us, right? Like, mm. think about your non-screenshot instruction. Think about your IKEA instructions. They are simplified for us to focus on what really matters, on where to put that screw in that nail, right? Mm. And so the simplified screenshots are more or less just an adaption of that same you know, psychological philosophy or not philosophy, but mindset of keeping graphics simple so the user can focus on what really, really matters. And so the history for me and TechSmith to SUI um, started around 2011 or 2012. We were developing a Chrome version for uh, Google Chrome for Snagit. And one of our instructional designers at the time was looking at some Google documentation and they had used that SUI style graphics in their own little onboarding dialogues on how to install um, a Google Chrome app back, I think in 2012, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And he thought it was really, really cool because it was modern. It was intriguing. It looked good. And yeah, it helped him to focus really, or to, he was able to uh, look at the instructions and the graphics and really see what mattered. And so he took that to the rest of the instructional design team and said, hey, this is really cool. We should start doing this for some of our own graphics, our own onboarding graphics in our own docs team. And that's how we got kind of introduced to it, or that's, that was our kind of like, yeah, finding its stories through the documentation from Google Chrome. Um, and then we just kind of jumped on it and ran with it. And um, yeah, for a couple of years, we just created onboarding documentation or a couple of the graphics in that sui style we actually started the complicated way we started making uh, tutorials and full style videos with that stuff of in that style as opposed to just the screenshots um and yeah it just kind of stuck and we saw the benefits of it and um in the long run we decided hey maybe this is something we could actually turn into a feature and a tool to make it even more easy to create it because uh, at that point yeah we've been seeing that style creep up everywhere in like a lot of marketing communication, but also in a lot of really just like proper documentation and also in a lot of onboarding, actually. That's where I see a lot of it. And that's where I also think that it has a lot of potential and a lot of benefit when it comes into that instance where the user first is introduced to a new feature or a new software. I think that that's where SUI can really, really shine. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, have you um, noticed in your travels some standout um, sort of um, simplified user interface or SUI style um, uh, marketing material. I know I've seen some for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was reading a book a while ago on graphics and visuals and the author cited a study where uh, people were presented with a photograph. This is, think about assembly or like car maintenance manuals or something. People are presented with a photograph and others were presented with a line drawing of the same sort of uh, objects. And the people with a line drawing um, were able to be much more efficient, right? The photograph introduces so much more detail that could be extraneous and it's distracting, right? And it, in the same way, when we take screenshots, even if you don't simplify the screenshot, we're usually zo zooming in on a certain part, right? We're simplifying right. the whole already. This is just taking it to another level. So I think there is really uh, a, a good solid foundation for this SUI practice uh, that Anton's describing. Hmm. I know I've definitely seen um, uh, Slack use this technique extensively in their onboarding. Um, I think that's probably the first place that I, I saw it. A lot of their um, their onboarding and sometimes their updates as well feature simplified user interface um, treatments as well. So yeah, it's definitely, I think your observation about the evolution there, Anton, is is um, really interesting because I have definitely seen an increase in adoption of this technique um, across many different industries, not just technology. It's it's uh, a whole mm -hmm. lot of different industries as well that use this. Well, the, the, the uh, time where the, the uh, simplified user screenshot, whatever, becomes paramount and impossible not to do is when you start localizing. Have you ever tried to localize a screenshot? It's like, oh my gosh, you, you just can't do it unless you have another user interface in another language run by another user who's navigating. So yeah, mm -hmm. when you think, oh, this is going to be localized, well, then you have to do something. Exactly. And this seems like a great approach. But even apart from the localization, localization, it does seem like um, just something that 
is, is worthwhile in its own right. Yeah, the localization piece you bring up is really interesting because um, when I introduced myself, I didn't tell part of my backstory. And that is when I started shipping at TechSmith, first I was in shipping, not that interesting. But soon thereafter, I was slipped as an intern into a documentation and training. And it was my job to actually create and recreate all the screenshots and tutorials in all the other languages. So my colleagues would usually create the English ones and then they would say, hey, Anton, go do German and French for us and maybe Japanese if you have time. And it was that as, uh, as you were saying, that tedious job of just booting up your second system in the different language, reinstalling everything, and then taking these screenshots. And later on, we fought, like virtual machines felt very generous and very lucky when they finally, finally came around. But still, yeah, super tedious job and very, very painful. I know exactly. Uh, I know from personal experience what that is and was like. And um, yeah, with the SUI stuff, you can sometimes cut some corners in a, in a very good way. Um, and I've seen like Microsoft does a fantastic job of that in uh, a lot of the onboarding for Microsoft Edge browser. Actually, if you just Google like Microsoft Edge onboarding center, you'll find a lot of brilliant examples of it where they design the graphics entirely free of text, right? So they're really just representing everything so through icons. Uh, it's, it's zoomed in, they use a lot of little animations. So they use like animated SUI or simplified graphic animations and GIFs. And then the text that supports the graphic that the user can still read to see which file menu they're really looking at and what they're trying to accomplish is in the captions below the, the actually embedded graphic. And so they can take that same graphic and have it really yeah, and all the help centers and all the different languages, and they don't have to touch that graphic a single time. They can use that same one over and over again. And that is, I think, really fast, fascinating when you can get to that point in your docs where like one graphic can rule all languages. Absolutely. What you're talking about there is actually what we've got on the screen at the moment should be working. Oh, beautiful. So you'll see that um, they've actually, they've done exactly that with all their screens. They've taken a lot of the detail out, even, even to the level of, you know, the browser tabs and everything like that. Um, it's very, very flat and very, very low in detail, but it still conveys so much meaning when you look at the images. So, yeah, this is a, it's a really, really good example of um, what you can, what level you can take simplified user interfaces to, even things like cards. It's, it's wonderful to yeah. see how they've done this. Yeah, and I, if you just scroll up for a second so you can take another look at um, the one with the cards on it, with the two faces on it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Let's go down there. One thing I really like about it as well, and it didn't really dawn to me until I was visiting a customer of ours and the woman, she had to work with a lot of dashboards and interfaces uh, that showed personal data and that showed actual company data. And she spent so much time having to fix things up and creating fake user accounts. I mean, we started talking about, yeah, simplification. It like dawned on her that she could just kind of create these simplified representations because it doesn't really matter what name is written there because mm -hmm. she was just talking about the functionality and the software, right? She just needed like Acme content, dummy content. Mm. And so for her, the realization of like, I, that she could just strip out all, all of that data and replace it through simpler shapes really made a big difference for her. And I know she, she kept up with it for a couple, couple of projects, at least. I haven't talked to her in a little bit, but yeah. Mm, that's really, hey, really nice. Hey, hey uh, Anton, what would yeah. be a more concrete, or what would be the concrete approach to simplifying a screenshot? I mean, would you start by uh, recreating it or would you convert an existing screenshot into it's, something like would you convert yeah. it? Into, yeah. Tell us like tactical, tactically speaking. Yeah. Would I think. would start by taking a screenshot, a normal classic screenshot of the interface of the software that I need to document. Let's, let's maybe say let's focus on a drop down menu, like file and then print or something like that. So we can all visualize that. Right. And then based on that, I would bring that into image editing software. It doesn't really matter which one, right. And some, some keep it simpler, some make it more complicated, but honestly, all you need is any kind of image editing software, like even PowerPoint works. And then before I would go on to simplify and cover up text boxes with simpler shapes, I would think I would first reduce the complexity of the screenshot. So I'm a big fan of going in and actually deleting buttons and little icons that are not needed, right? Um, in some cases, there might be too many men like menu entries in the drop-down menu. So maybe I can just shorten that a little bit because I'm 
to the point that you were saying earlier, Tom, like reducing the complexity of information that is in that screenshot, like those people that were working with those lines and had the, the photograph and comparison, right? Just reduce that a little bit. And when you have the actual screenshot somewhat reduced and you have all the unnecessary elements um, removed, yeah, then as a next step, I would cover up all the um, text elements through evenly spaced and evenly spaced uh, bars. Right, so I would use the drawing tool, or if I'm using Snagit, I can automate that. But let's just stick with the tool that everything uh, reflects drawing tools that anybody can use, really. You know, I would cover them up. If you're using something like Illustrator, use some lines and some guides to keep them aligned. And I would only keep those things exposed that, um, there's two things I keep exposed. The first thing is the main action that is actually important, right? The file menu and then maybe the print option that they have to click on because I want the users in most cases to still be able to follow the main instruction. And then what I also like to keep visual are any kind of like visual anchor points or reference points, if you think of them, right? Like anything like a logo or an icon that can help the user orient themselves when they're looking at your simplified screenshot because they still have to take the information or your simplified screenshot and your instructions and relay them over to the actual software that they are using. So you do need to keep some of these visual reference points. And some of them are like simple things like um, the little X in the corner of a window. So they know it's a window that can be closed or maybe the safe button because it's big and blue and dominant on most systems or little icons for different um, features or tools. So even if you don't have the name of the feature spelled out in the drop down menu, keep the icon visible so the user can use that to visually orient themselves. So yeah, that's kind of the approach I would do. So start with the screenshot first, reduce its complexity by just kind of trim trimming it, uh, then cover anything up that isn't needed while keeping the main instruction or the main action as well as any visual anchor points exposed to help guide the user. Yeah, that's, hey, that's perfect. Thanks. That is, that is a very, very good overview of how you would do it. Now, what I'm going to do, this is a bit rough and ready, but um, in our... Um, Google Doc that we use to uh, plan the plan to show a bit of an inside baseball here, folks. We've got some <laughs> uh, screenshots of just what Anton described. So I'm going to attempt to just quickly share this Google Doc. It isn't pretty, and don't worry, Tom. It's not our notes doc. It's just a, a new one. So you'll see in this image and what Anton was describing um, for a, a menu there. So what you've got is a file menu. You can see it's, well, actually walk us through it, uh, Anton. Like you will see that oh. there's elements there that, you know, um, compared to like a side-by-side, -side, it's really apparent, but there's key things in here that you've decided to simplify, um, isn't there? Yeah, so happy to walk you through this. So on the left-hand side, of course, the original um, screenshot, you could say, the one I would then take into my illustrators, software or into Snagit. And then the right side is a simplified version. And the first thing I'm going to call out are the reductions and just generally reducing the screenshot steps that I did. So you'll notice that I purposely took out the edit, modify, text, view, and share options at the very top in the menu bar because they were not that important to the instructions for my user, which is click on file, connect mobile device. Mm. Then I also took out all the hotkeys because I find them also a bit distracting to what actually the main instruction is in this case. So I just deleted them, edited them out, didn't take that much time. And then I covered everything up with the gray boxes that to represent the, yeah, where the text lines would have been or the text strings would have been. And I only kept the main two things exposed that need to be exposed, which is file, connect mobile device. And as a little cherry on top, I also make my mouse cursor a little bit larger so it's easier for the user to see. But that's essentially how I would, yeah, simplify a simple screenshot like this. I imagine that um, having the the menu in place with the, I guess, the, the blanked out information mm -hmm. still gives readers the context of where they might find this in the menu. Because sometimes you say, you know, file, connect mobile device, and you've got a really long menu. Sometimes right. you have to go hunting, right? It could also be in a sub menu or something like that. So I'd imagine that still having the, the blanked out lines there gives the, the, the reader of the documentation or the person using the instruction just enough information to work out where they need to go in the menu. I completely agree with you. And uh, I was running a workshop on simplified user interface design here in Germany at a large company. Mm. And we actually got into discussion of like, how do we actually, how should we design drop down menus when we're using simplified user interface design? Because should all the text, the 
uh, the boxes we're using for the text strings, should they all be the same size? Should they vary in size? Do they need to have the same size as the original or can they alter and simply just look visually appealing? Do we need the little divider lines? Does it need to be the exact like number of entries down? And there was some back and forth and the result we're sharing on the screen right now is kind of what the group decided on was the most important or the most, yeah, the most realistic to use. And the, the important things about it were uh, on the one hand that the connect mobile device or the option you're trying to show is roughly in the same spot where the user should be looking. So if it's at the bottom of the drop down menu, keep it at the bottom of the drop down menu. If you can keep it a bit more clear, where it's like second from the last, do that as well. Then also you'll notice these really thin dividing line that were in the original menu to kind of break up the original menu into sections. Mm. And uh, yeah, the group decided or kind of discussed and agreed upon that keeping those lines also help the user orient themselves. Again, they're kind of like those visual anchors that they can look at and be like, all right, it's in the third section towards the bottom, bam. And because yeah, it's still important that the user doesn't get lost and doesn't get confused by this uh, screenshot, which essentially looks different than the software they're actually using. So yeah, we have to keep, make sure that they can still find their way. Mm. Mm, some really good points there. That's a really great uh, description of in practice, how you actually do a simplified screenshot. There's uh, welcome to the show. Incidentally, Chris, thanks for, for joining us there a little bit later than normal. Um, you had a, a clashing <laughs> appointment, but um, it's great to have you as always, mate. Um, so we we're just uh, talking about sort of the, uh, I guess the, the basic overview of what a, a SUI is. Um, and, I guess the the other side of it too, um, Anton, is that I'd imagine that you know if you're actually doing uh, like measuring the effectiveness of of these sort of you're taking the time to go and do mm -hmm. one of these um, simplified user interfaces across your docs, you want to try and be able to measure and try and qualify if the, if it's actually worth it, right? Right. Now I'd imagine that you know um, over over the years you probably have some pretty good um, quantitative data about that, um, uh, about, you know, what the effect is of actually doing this in the documentation. What sort of insights have you learned about um, uh, simplified user interfaces and, and how users interact with them differently when they're looking at a page? Yeah, so um, there's two, there's almost like two questions in your question because the one thing is really the effectiveness of it from the, the tech writer's perspective or the documentarian's perspective, right? How much time could a graphic actually help me, uh, yeah, how much time could this graphic actually help me save in the long run and when is it not saving me time, right? That mental process of when should I do it and when should I not? Mm -hmm. And on the other side is really how are users responding to it and are they are they being able to follow the instructions more effectively? Mm -hmm. And I don't have clear answers and clear data on it. And even the anecdotal data we have received from users, some say they really enjoy the style. Some people say they really don't. But what we have tried to, to better analyze um, is really um, the, the, the cognitive load a little bit. Like how complex are these graphics? How difficult is it for a user to look at original screenshots and simplified screenshots and where are they essentially looking? And that is mm. something I was able to do with some minor eye tracking tests. And I see you're putting that up on the screen. So that's, that's perfect. Mm. Cause it, if you're looking at this, so this is actually, it's, it's pretty fascinating. This was done using predictive eye tracking. Do you guys know what predictive eye tracking is? I haven't heard of that before. It sounds interesting. Oh, it's super cool. So, um, you know what traditional eye tracking is, right? Just normal set of, sit a person in front of a computer, they look at it and the software measures where they're looking. And because all the data is available, a lot of, um, well not a lot, but several companies have turned their data and put, it, put some AI to good use. And they've come up with the algorithm that allow you to essentially predict and calculate eye tracking results without actually having to have real people sit in front of the computer looking at things. Wow. And um, <laughs> oh, it's really, really fascinating. And uh, it's excellent. You don't I, have to worry I, about those pesky users. <laughs> yeah, no, but the beautiful thing is like, I would never get a budget to hardcore do a lot of testing on my screenshots, right? Yeah. But because I met this guy who is working for one of these companies, he gave me access to, to his eye tracking uh, engine. And I was able to run a bunch of my screenshots and images through there. And it predicted where people would be looking. And it's the first time I ever done like real testing on 
user perception of my own or anyone else's screenshots. And the results were really fascinating because they you can see where people are looking simply based on shapes, contrast, complexity of the image. Um, and so if you're looking at the screen right now, on the left side, we can see that the user is, yeah, scanning the, the menu entries and they, they do end up with connect mobile device, which is the main instruction for the step. But you can also very clearly see that other options on the screen that are not relevant are drawing or demanding attention, like the hotkeys on the right side. That's pretty clear. I, I, actually, this, this really jumped out at me. I have never thought about the hotkeys as being so distracting. Yeah, um, me and it, It's interesting yeah. because as a kind of advanced dish user, I'm often looking for them because I want to know what they are for future reference. But if you're not interested in that, it's like a lot of extra junk on the screen. I never really thought about it. It's uh, quite interesting, actually. Yeah, and that was one of the, when I saw that initial first eye tracking result, it was my first reaction was, well, let's, let me Photoshop those uh, hotkeys out of the screenshot because they're not really important right now. And then, uh, yeah, and then when you, we simplified that screenshot and we went into that same engine, you can like just see the difference in where is the user focus, focusing. And of course, there's so much more to how effective with that screenshot can they work with it in order to get their job done faster or better. But nevertheless, I think this is a really great visual starting point to for us to really like think more about our screenshots and how maybe the our yeah the end users are really perceiving them and how it's affecting them and where they're looking. Mm, this is a this is probably the strongest um, display of what simplification uh, that's the treatment does because I never really gave much thought to I, I knew that they were better and they felt better to look at i knew they were going to save me time when i'm maintaining my docs but this is something you could take to your manager and say hey i need the right tools to do this because look look at the <laughs> data right <laughs> it's very good Man. can can i ask apologies if everybody asked this question <laughs> <laughs> that's all right um so I'm going to revisit this uh, whenever they may be not helpful. So firstly, stop me if you've already asked that. No, we haven't. That's a really good segue, actually. Yeah, let's do this. Because I, I, was, I was experimenting um, with Snagit, actually, on some of just trying to simplify some various interfaces to see the effect. And I hit some examples, for example, an application like Discord, which has a lot down the side and a lot at the top. Uh, in fact, I'm looking at Slack is very similar. Spark, which is an email client, again, very similar, like lots of things down one side, lots of things across the top, like where you've got lots of things on the screen. And then trying the simplification, you end up with just like literally nothing left. <laughs> so, so, and I sort of wonder where's the, where's the middle ground to, to you know, you oversimplify or, or yeah, when is it in a context where they're not helpful and they're actually just kind of useless because there's nothing to navigate. Yeah, so you bring up an excellent point, Chris, because there's also lots of examples of simplified user interface graphics out there where they did go too far. And I was praising Microsoft earlier, but they have one. It's, I think, the option of how to send uh, a tab over to another device. Anyway, you look if you're looking at that graphic, it just makes no sense because they're contextually jumping in between three devices. They are selecting the fifth like they have a long drop down menu, but they don't actually show the string you're clicking on. It's just confusing. And in that case, yeah, it was just too much and it does not make sense to use it in that case. Um, and, and I pulled up my Slack application just to kind of have it in front of me. And I would also say, yeah, if I were to simplify all of it, it would be lots of bars, but it would be a mess and not recognizable and wouldn't make sense. So hmm. it, that, there are a lot of cases where it doesn't make sense. But if we go back to Slack as the example, maybe there is maybe you need to take a screenshot of part of the application, right? So you're already reducing how much is on there. And then you're really trying to draw attention to um, maybe the, the new message icon or something like that. That's kind of clear where you can reduce the rest of it, but it's, you still make, you still keep it clear, like which application you're in and you're not sure trying to simplify everything, but you're just using it for in, like a region or like a section of the software for one particular use case. Um, but there's also many, many, like people sometimes ask me, like, should I simplify everything, right? Is that now the, the key to, to happiness? And of course it's not, mm. <laughs> I wish it was, but no, um, because it's, there's so many situations where normal screenshot is still the better option. Some, it's much, sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's clearer based on the audience. Like 
I'm sorry, I, I don't like to bring up like grandparents or old people as an example, but if I were to show something to my grandma, if I were to show her a Sui screenshot, she would be so lost. She would have no idea what I'm trying to tell her. I'd be lucky if she can use a normal screenshot, but she might, you know? So there's that factor as well of like, who's your audience? Who's going to look at that? What is their comfort level with that? And I think maybe we're all quite tech heavy, right? Uh, mm. Tech nerdy. So we, of course, are instantly can use that information and use that effectively, yeah, but that might not be true for, for everybody, right? Um, <clears throat> so oftentimes I kind of think of Sui as actually like, being like this tactic that us technical communicators, it's like a tactic we have up our sleeve that we can pull out whenever it makes a lot of sense. And then we use it very effectively and precisely. And then we put it back in and we do a bunch of normal screenshots and documentation. And then when we get to maybe a situation where we have to onboard, uh, create onboarding content, where I think SUI works fantastically well, then we bust it back out and we, we make a couple SUI graphics for that particular purpose. Um, yeah, but it's not an all in or all out, but kind of more like selectively and strategically. Hmm. I've got, a, I got a question for, for you, Anton here. Uh, you know, this topic about screenshots seems to, um, bring up the fact that there's so many different approaches that people have about doing screenshots, not only just, you know, capturing anchor points and, and some of these things you've mentioned, but how many, sometimes people put a little thumbnail that expands sometimes, um, uh, people use certain uh, colors for the callouts, little lines and annotations. You know, there's lots of different styles and approaches. Does TechSmith have a style guide where they define usage and best practices for images in their documentation? Internally, yes, we do. We do have our own style guide um, that was written and is being used by our team. Yeah, we have a small team of tech writers as well. Is it is it um, much more detailed than than other style guides? I mean, given that you guys are focused on this stuff, probably not. I'm gonna say like we keep our screenshots still fairly simple. We we had a lot of internal discussions about whether or not to localize all screenshots, or if we can use English screenshots in some of the other languages as well. Um, but I I mean we do. It's what is that saying? Uh, eat your own dog food, right? We do mm. take pride in the screenshots we take. So we do make sure that the stuff looks good and it reflects well on, on our company. So of course we have like a set set of colors and like line width uh, when we do like, when we draw our rectangle boxes and things like that, that is predefined on how to use it. And um, yeah, for those screenshots. And I know on the other side, on the, the video creation side, where we also use with, work with a SUI graphics sometimes, we also work, yeah, we kind of have to show, as you were saying, right? We're the screenshot company, we're the screencasting company our stuff has to be good, right? And has to be presentable in a lot of ways. And so we do use, as I was saying, like the SUI graphics, we use them in our own onboarding as well and selectively, not everywhere. You'll find a lot of, you'll find a lot of normal screenshots in there as well. But yeah, we do have, have our own uh, uses for them as well that we found and are kind of trying to embrace it. Given that, sure. given that text, TechSmith kind of has both video and screen capture software among others, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on animated GIFs or other kind of motion in screenshots and mm -hmm. if you think that's good practice or is that just annoying? I think it's fantastic practice. I think they're, <laughs> Love them too. they're wonderful. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so Chris knows this because Chris has met me a couple of times, but I'm, I'm a huge video nerd when it comes to like screencasts and instructional videos. I, as I was telling you earlier, I had to do all the screenshots. Guess what? I also got to do all the videos in German, Japanese, French, and Korean, right? So yeah. I'm a, like tech video nerd. And um, to me, like any evolution of that medium and use of that medium is exciting. And so what I really like about animated GIFs in general is that they're the perfect medium between a screenshot and a video where a video would be too much and annoying and an image is just not showing enough because it's maybe two or three clicks animated gifs or gifs i don't know which camp you're in um they're that perfect middle ground for yeah showing a quick action especially like introducing maybe a new feature showing a new workflow showing something that's two or three clicks long and then um combined with simplified user interface design, I think that works really, really well as well because you're sh being able to show more than a simple image could, but you're not having to watch a full video. And so you're still able to 
almost with the animations of this of the yeah with the the movements and the animation you they're almost more effective because if there's a mouse cursor in there they they uh, help to draw the attention even further and even more and yeah so I, I'm a huge fan of them I think there's huge potential in or there should be more use of them and uh, if you're ever looking for fantastic examples um, I highly recommend Adobe Illustrator their docs have some really really nice um, animations sui animations in them so. I look at them for inspiration on a regular. Mm, good tip. We'll have to go and check those out. Because I, when I've been doing the images, I, I've been thinking how great would it be to see the same treatment in videos. But then I wonder. Then I think that that can't be easy to do. If you, it's easy enough yeah, to do it's, one. Yeah, it takes a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It, what if you wanted to go down that path <laughs> and do it? How, how do you even do simplification in videos? What is the technique? Um, so you're essentially rebuilding it as an animation. So you right. would create screenshots of every state of the software that you need, right? Or the main software and then the drop down menu and then the drop down menu with the option exposed. Um, and then you would export those, as, export those as screenshots and animate them in Camtasia or an animation software like Photoshop. Or I know someone who actually works, does it all in a uh, PowerPoint, which is pretty fascinating. Wow, PowerPoint. But you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a Swiss knife. Amazing of things in it? PowerPoint. Actually, <laughs> yeah. don't don't knock it. I hang out in a in a video professionals um, like office hours group, and it's not PowerPoint, but a lot of them really swear for Keynote for creating animations. So. Keynote. <laughs> ah. yeah. There uh, you go. Yeah. <laughs> Learned another thing today. Here you go. And <laughs> Keynote for animations. There you go. A, a low. I imagine it'd be like a, a low-fi way of just doing it. That's something that. Uh, it sounds like another podcast episode all on the I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> get someone from Apple. I very much doubt it. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's a, that, that was something that has been on my mind for a while, like doing videos because, geez, it looks good when it's done right. And I've seen yep. some that have been done right. Again, I'll reference Slack here, who actually do a, quite a nice onboarding video um, with simplification in mind. Um, it just comes across so well when it's done right so yeah yeah I, again when you add videos into the mix you've got that extra maintenance overhead of course but you know if it's worth the effort you'd do it um particularly in training i can see where it's super valuable in training it would actually almost be worth the effort to actually go through and update um training modules with this type of treatment um so yeah that's a, a very interesting idea um so I'll, i'm circling back to um, the, I guess the different types of simplified user interface treatments that you've seen. We saw mm -hmm. earlier in the show um, one such treatment where you've done it for a um, a menu. In your time doing this, have you seen sort of do, do have you seen a trend? Maybe trends the wrong word, but mm -hmm. a a sort of uh, taxonomy for simplification. Um, in the different products uh, or in the different uh, areas you're looking at. Uh, what do they sort of fall into as far as maybe levels of, of obfuscation or like um, maybe could you even almost apply some type of template to these simplified user interfaces to an extent? What's your experience being there? Yeah, it, it really varies because it, <clears throat> it's like, yeah, it really varies because it's not, there's not, it's not a current standard per se, but it more seems like some tech doc departments get lucky enough to try and experiment it. And they're almost all finding their own approach. Um, but what I, what I have seen is clear differences in when they're being used in like marketing content and when they're being used in tech doc content. And in marketing content, even like some of the Slack or Asana onboarding or like, hello, hello welcome to greet you kind of stuff they're showing. It's designed to look pretty and draw your attention, but it's not really designed to convey an instructional message. Mm -hmm. And so they use colors and contrast in a lot of different ways. They want, they have a lot of things that almost yeah, are contrasting with each other. So they pop out more, which on the instructional side, you don't really see there. You see more carefully designed screenshot where they're using, um, yeah, where they're reducing, trying to reduce brightly clashing colors in the like, um, reduced, so like the reduced elements, right? The bars that go on the screenshot to cover up the different strings. Those in instruction screenshots are usually kept 
very light in color. So they don't pop out because we don't want the user to look at them. We want the user to look at the remaining option, which might be in, from the example from earlier, file, connect mobile device, right? And so I'm seeing some differences in there and the way they're being styled simply based on where the user should be looking and what impact they're supposed to have on them. Um, I've also noticed that in TechDoc, they, they or we, we pay a lot more attention to making sure the screenshot is accurate in representing the software it represents. So we make sure it still has the right menus and it's in the right corner while like marketing, yeah, mostly marketing content, we've seen it in new newsletters and stuff like that. They take a lot of liberties and it's, it, I mean, it has a different purpose really, but it's, it's, yeah, it's the same origin or the same style of graphic just with different use cases and, and for that. This seems to yeah. lead us into, oh, sorry. Um, I was going to say, it sort of leads us into, I guess, the uh, design of good simplified user interfaces. Like you've already mentioned color patterns there um, as one way of actually, you know, sort of designing your screenshot. What are some other good basic, you know, basic good design mm -hmm. patterns you can use when you're thinking about uh, SUIs? Yeah, so to just follow up on that color palette. So what helps for you is to pick a color palette of what are main menu entries, what are sub-menu entries, kind of defining that. If you're serious, create a style guide, write that down because that allows you to then also use it consistently from screenshot to screenshot. And that was mm. a big thing for many of the users who wanted to start using SUI is, yeah, making sure that all the screenshots follow that same yeah, taxonomy and the same color structure, color coding when it comes to the different, um, yeah, when it comes to what the meaning is, so you can almost create some sort of legend and, and train your users in understanding your screenshots if you're using the colors consistently. So that is the, the one thing that I would recommend as kind of like a best, best practice. I mentioned it earlier, but using visual anchors in the screenshot to help the user to still orient themselves. And so for me, visual anchors are often uh, icons, dominant logos, dominant colors and buttons. So sometimes like a big blue button in the bottom left, keeping those in there to help them orient themselves. Um, to Chris's point from earlier, not simplifying too much, right? Don't go crazy, but keep, keep that balance. And a good way of actually doing that is asking other people for feedback. Ask your colleague, call up Chris, see if, uh, show him a screenshot and see what he thinks of it, right? Um, but all along, like even this graphics I've been creating, my team has been creating, they have evolved, right? Because we're getting feedback and we're trying to get better with it and try to really understand what works. Um, and then to a point I mentioned earlier as well is, um, yeah, when you have a complex user interface, ask yourself if, if there's anything you can actually remove that is not that important. And honestly, I'm looking at the Slack app right now, and there's a lot of little like formatting tools that are not that important that I could probably delete half of. Nobody would notice, but the screenshot would be less complex to begin with, right? And therefore would be easier on the user to perceive, easier for them to mentally process, and hopefully better for them or allow them to better follow the instructions, whatever they might be. Um, further in terms of best practices, so um, depending on the tool you use, um, so when I was doing them, for example, in Illustrator, I was a huge fan of layering. I almost recreated my own software in Illustrator and I layer, but I named all my layers and I kept everything nicely organized in groups because once I had this master version of my software interface as actually as a vector graphic, uh, but I didn't need it as a vector. Anyway, I had this one master version. It was very easy for me to just turn on and off the options I kind of needed and generate screenshots out of that. And it was a good way to keep simple, uh, keep organized, especially when the, the software is rather complex and there's a lot to it um, that, might, that might save you some time. Um, <clears throat> another thing I learned to, to do and love is uh, treat the mouse cursor as a separate icon. So I don't even capture my own mouse cursor in all of my screenshots, but rather I just have a graphic on my computer that I use so I can always just place it perfectly where I need it to be. Um, and my mouse cursor graphic is a little bit bigger and a bit more, yeah, it attracts more attention or it demands more attention. So I'm using that hopefully to, to help guide my users to where they should be clicking. Um, other best practices. So we, we had the grouping and the layering if you're using something more hardcore like uh, Illustrator or GIMP or Affinity. Um, color palettes and using them consistently across multiple window, uh, across multiple screenshots, usually using visual anchors and like reference points really so the user can find themselves in it. And at the end, yeah, not overdoing it, right? Don't 
simplify everything to the point where it's again too confusing that's not the goal here but rather we're just trying to make simpler screenshots that are actually easier to follow that is what you have to keep in mind so uh, try it out but also maybe do some testing <laughs> mm. Chris, did you have something else to add? Sorry, or was it Tom that I interrupted oh, rudely before? <laughs> oh, no, hey, uh, this is great info. I really like how practical it is. I'm kind of wondering um, how you would approach certain scenario. Every now and then, I run across people who are anti-screenshot. Um, for example, I was uh, some months ago, there was an engineering manager who was like, hey, don't put any screenshots in the documentation. They just go out of date. Like it was a blanket sort of rule. And I, I meet other people who are like, yeah, you should never use screenshots and documentation and so on. What do you say to these people? When do you decide to do a visual and when do you decide not to do a visual? Man, well, I guess the question is, who are you writing the documentation for? Are you writing the documentation because you have some requirement to meet and you don't really care what it does? Or are you trying to write it for the users? And are the users really relying relying on it to use your machine or your product. And if your user is really actually needs that guide to operate your product or your software, then I would definitely use visuals and screenshots, even if they are time consuming and sometimes a pain um, and they have to be updated because visuals of all kinds um, help users just perceive and consume the information and understand it a lot better. And there's so many studies out there. You mentioned one earlier. There's a couple other ones as well that just visuals make, yeah, make it easier for people to understand instructions and information, but they also, it's, it's, it's a format that users want, right? There's a lot of studies out there that also say that, yeah, what users want instructions and information that is supported by visuals, whether that's images or videos. And that is a demand that you could also maybe lean into if you're looking to expand your customer base or your boss is trying to expand the customer base by saying, hey, our documentation is better than the comp competitor's documentation because it's visual. It's supported by nice graphics so our users have less initial startup time because they get going. And maybe maybe the, the happy compromise in that situation would be to, of course, not document everything with screenshots, but pick a couple selective things where you can say, this is an area that would really benefit from some screenshots. Maybe it's your getting started guide, the first thing the user sees. Maybe it's the troubleshooting guide where a lot of people have issues and with images, you can maybe reduce the amount of phone calls you get because things get more clear. And that's how I would maybe approach it with the manager of being like, we can maybe not do all, but we should really do it strategically in a few places and then see what they maybe say to that. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that that's great. And in this scenario, like I said, it was quite a while ago, but um, uh, the team was focused on code, right? Which is like a different scenario. Mm. But even when people are writing code, they're usually, they're usually some output, right? They're building an app yeah. or they're doing something that is visual at the end. And that is often something that needs to be, uh, you know, captured and right. presented. This is actually something I'd be interested in digging into because Anton, so far you've mentioned a lot of, kind of graphical tools, um, auto-generating screenshots is possible, especially with more developer-focused tools. And I wonder, I'm pretty sure it would be possible to create simplified user interfaces, screenshots from some of those automated tools, but it require a bit of work. But <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about it, it probably would be possible because they're using standard tools like Image Magic and stuff, and you can do layering and things if you wanted to. But... Um, yeah, on some object possible. recognition over it. I mean, that's what Snagit does, yeah. right? It, it yeah. just scans the image and looks for elements and then tries to do some magic. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, I was thinking about how you could do that. That's an experiment to try. <laughs> yeah, the question Snagit is whether or not. Server. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I've suggested it, but uh, I didn't get much uh, feedback on it, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things with, um, so we talked a little bit, you said the screenshots are hard to update, right? Uh, Tom, mm. A couple of minutes ago. And it's actually a situation or a use case for SUI as well that I've seen a few times. And we've actually had that internally at TechSmith as well, where we created an animation or we created a lot of onboarding animations for Snagit, with Snagit, in Snagit. Um, but we try to uh, design them in such a way that they can stay up up to date for a couple of versions. So we just make sure we 
don't mention the version number in the graphic. We try not to change our software interface as much anymore as we used to. So screenshots have a longer lifespan. Um, but because of that, like a couple of the simplified user interface animations we've put in the product have been in there for, I think, like four or five versions now in multiple languages. So kind of going back to the question or the, the idea from earlier, like um, when does it make sense? When does it pay off to create these screenshots? Maybe then you can say, hey, this one screenshot has been in the running for five years now for five software versions and we have yet to update it. Uh, we have not yet to update it. Maybe that's also one of those arguments that you, Tom, can take to, to that manager and say, hey, um, maybe we can do some of that and see it's going to stay with us for a long time depending on the, on, on the, the app, of course. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, the, the classic scenario that all tech writers work in is, is documenting something that's not fully built, right? Mm -hmm. It's like constantly changing so that's why you often get pushback people will say yeah. hey do, you know don't don't take a screenshot yet i just changed stuff right but if you've simplified it as you've been telling us then maybe it's not need to so yeah yeah maybe it can actually survive the couple changes the developers are still gonna do to it you know or maybe the difference is not as noticeable in the simplified version as it would have been in a real screenshot i can actually so. recount a, a real life um, instance here, I was using Snagit 2020 um, during the development phase of Squiz's new CMS uh, matrix. And um, they were doing a massive overhaul of the user interface. And I needed to produce uh, basically uh, the first iteration of the docs that were going to be released with the product. And um, we all knew as a team that the interface was going to change radically. And we accepted that as one of the, the, the bits of tech deck for the documentation, but using Snagit 2020, I was able to take a representative um, uh, shot of the interface and with enough simplification in it, I think I managed to keep the the diagram in place of, it was like a, you know, here's the UI, I use callouts regions to mark mm -hmm. up the different parts of the UI. And I was able to keep that in there through a series of rapid iteration cycles for around five to six months. Now it doesn't seem like a long time, but I would have had to change that screenshot probably 10 times during the iteration of it. And that, that six months is, is worth the cost of entry for me. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Like it was, it was <laughs> such a huge relief not to have to go and even just think about having to maintain the screenshots. I knew that that particular one, which was in getting started, it's the first tab you see when you load the, the matrix docs. That was safe. I didn't have to worry yeah. myself with that. And it was such a relief. So oh, that's wonderful. So yeah, that's really that was cool really that you got thing. to experience it firsthand. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. No, it was very, very good. Well, I can't believe it, but we're actually getting towards the, uh, the end of the show. But rather than just um, taper off quickly, Tom and Chris, did you have any other questions or anything that you wanted to just slip in before we wrap up the show? Um, I, I just wanted to maybe make it apparent in case people are listening and wondering, we're not sponsored in any way by TechSmith. Like no. this is not any kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I know, no, I'm just, I'm trying to clarify because sometimes people listen to these, these shows or podcasts and are like, Hmm, wonder what, the, wonder what TechSmith is paying them. No, mm. not, not at all. So just wanted to <laughs> clarify that. That's right. And I, I will say this, that, you know, it, Anton, I think you've been very, very careful <laughs> in, in your entire session today, not really to talk about <laughs> Snagit that much. So I'd like to actually give you the opportunity to, to do that now, because uh, like I've mentioned, I've dropped it a couple of times in the show that, you know, I've, Snagit 2020 was used and, and I was doing it, but like for people who perhaps um, aren't, um, familiar with what's in Snagit 2020 now and what the the new version offers here's your chance to give us a bit of an overview <laughs> you know just it's not sponsored right, here but, comes you know, my uh, my elevator pitch ready for the pitch yeah here we go all right three <laughs> two one all right so Snagit no let's do this for real so Snagit is a screenshot tool it's been around for 30 years so we've had a lot of time building it and building upon it and it has grown beyond just screenshots it has the screen videos now it has a full image editor in it and what I think is really cool about it it's an image editing program really designed for tech docs and tech writers and kind of like trainers and stuff in mind so a lot of features just kind of 
yeah, callouts, uh, simplification tool is built in and auto, auto simplifies your screenshots with the click of a button. You can like magnify things really easily and it helps you organize and store your captures. So just a really cool all around tool for yeah, visual communication and documentation. And um, yeah, the latest version 2021, just double down on, we didn't add anything super crazy cool and new, but rather we took a step back and just took a lot of user feedback and improved things like the simplify tool, the magnification tool, speed, etc. So we, yeah, we've been around for a long time. Snagit has been for a long time, but um, we, 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 uh, yeah, I think we're in a good spot and we have a lot of people using our software and we listen definitely to the feedback from, yeah, people on the show, people from everywhere around the world. It's fun. I've been working for them for a long time. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you seem really passionate about it, which is a, a good sign um, that you know you're you're enjoying what you do, which is awesome. Now, if folks want to learn some more about simplified user interfaces, where where are some places they can go to 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 go get into the weeds of this? Right, perfect question. So you can of course Google simplified user interface design. You'll find a couple of blog posts from me, a couple of blog posts on the TechSmith blog. There also is a really good talk from uh, Steve Steglin. He uh, presented at Write the Docs conference in Portland in 2018. So if you just search for Steve Steglin's talk at uh, the, that Portland event, it's really good. He talk, does a fantastic presentation on the topic. And then last but not least, me and a coworker, we started a Slack user group for anyone who's interested in SUI design. And we have, I think, 60 or 70 members now, just tech writers and trainers, et cetera, from all around the world. It's open to anyone and we just post examples and et cetera. So if that interests you, get in touch with me and I can send you an invitation. I don't know if there's an easier way than that. Uh, I've only, but I would say, uh, yeah, email me at a.bolan at techsmith.com. And maybe we can also post that uh, at some point somewhere. Yeah, we'll see if we can link that in. What's the uh, the name of the Slack group? Do you, is yeah, it, is it an easy one or is it like 50 characters long? It's called, <laughs> no, it's sim called Simplified Graphics. So maybe if you just Google, or not Google, but you search Slack for Simplified Graphics, you should be able to find it. Oh, great. And uh, yeah, no, it's, a great, it's a great place because it's just an open floor for anyone who, who cares about this stuff. That's really good. So if you want to up your uh, simplified user interface graphics, uh, yeah, get in there and get involved. That's terrific. Show us, well, show us examples. Oh, yeah. That's even better because that's the easiest way to learn sometimes. You see a new technique and, uh, you know, you look at what people are doing and that's uh, it's clearly the best way to get the new inspiration sometimes when you're doing things. Exactly. And then being yeah. able to ask like, hey, how did you do that? Right? Yeah. That is yeah, it's terrific. It's, it's sometimes wonderful. the best thing. Well, look, um, I think... Uh, that might have to be a wrap for today. Um, like it's been, uh, it's been as usual, a really informative episode. Um, we're always really thankful for our guests um, coming on and, and uh, certainly thankful for you uh, sharing your knowledge, Anton, today. It's been a wonderful introduction to um, simplified user interfaces, both, you know, using all the different tools you can use out there uh, along with a bit of overview of what Snake can do as well. So that's um, been really informative, really excellent. So that's, thanks for joining us today. Um, Thank you. Thanks as usual to Chris and Tom for lending your insights to the show today. It's always great to have you on. Um, and if you'd like to get involved in the Write the Docs podcast, you can, um, of course, join the Write the Docs Slack. Um, there's a podcast channel on Write the Docs Slack that you can come in, give us feedback about the show, tell us what you liked or disliked, or even suggest some um, show ideas for us to follow up on. We're always really, really keen to get the voices of Write the Docs uh, Slack onto the show. Um, and um, we're, we're always looking for, for new guests because Write the Docs has a, um, a huge amount of very smart people in there with a lot of very good ideas and we like to hear it on the show. So if you'd like to come on and do exactly what Anton have done today, get in touch with us. Um, so do that on Slack um, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll gladly have you on the show to talk about cool stuff. Um, but um, for now, that's a wrap for episode 33. And as always, remember docs or it didn't happen. Have a safe uh, time folks. And we'll see you next time. Bye.